In this lecture, we will discuss what is MLOps. MLOps is a set of practices to streamline and automate end-to-end -end machine learning lifecycle. If you are aware about software development, then there is this thing called DevOps. So it is very similar to that, but it is for machine learning projects. Now there are three important elements in end-to-end -end machine learning project lifecycle, develop, deploy, and monitor. Whenever you are building any machine learning application, you'll have to go through these stages. Let's first talk about develop stage. Let's say you have a team of data scientists, Kathy and Venkat. They both are working on a same machine learning project and they are building this credit risk model. It may happen that Kathy might be working on feature engineering, whereas Venkat might be working on model building. They need to collaborate. They need to work on a same notebook. How do they do that? Well, Kathy can uh, write this notebook and share it with Venkat on OneDrive. No, that's not how it works. We need sophisticated tools such as GitHub, where you can deploy your changes, you can manage your code versions. It is called version control system. GitHub is just a website. The underlying version control system is called Git. Git is very popular nowadays in software development as well as in machine learning development. It helps you track different versions of your code. It helps you roll back your changes. You can maintain different branches and so on. You might have worked on Google Docs where there is one document and multiple people can edit it. GitHub is similar, but it is for code and it provides a lot of extra features as well. So learning version control is an important part of ML ops. Other than code version control, we also need data version control. And there is this website dvc.org that talks about data version control because you have a data set, data set is changing. So you need versioning, right? Data set 1.2, 1.3, 1.4. Just like how you have versioning in your code, you also have versioning in your data. So version control comes under developed a stage of that MLOps lifecycle. There is another thing called experiment tracking. For this, a popular tool is MLflow. This allows you to track experiments. Just understand that experiment tracking is also part of develop stage. Then comes API development. Let's say you have trained a model, okay, on your local computer. Then you export it in a joblib file. Now, this model is sort of like a brain. It is a train, like just like our human brain. But only with brain, you cannot do anything. You have to have a body, your senses, you know, your hands and so on. Similarly, we need a body for this model.joblib file, which is just a brain of machine learning. So for that body, you will build a server. You can build a server using fast API, Flask. There are different uh, frameworks available, but basically this blue box is a body around this train brain. Then you deploy it to some cloud platform, AWS, Azure, GCP, whatever. And then any application can call uh, this server via API endpoints. See, the API endpoint looks something like this, where there is HTTP slash whatever. You give your data. You give your data such as, okay, what is my age? What is my income? What is my loan amount? And in response, it will tell you this. It will say your default probability is 90%, score is this, rating is poor and so on. Now, when we did this credit risk modeling project, we used Streamlit. In Streamlit, you can quickly prototype these applications. But in real life, uh, for enterprise applications, people don't use Streamlit. They use frameworks such as React, for example. They might have, let's say, Java application, okay? And all these applications will communicate with your server via HTTP calls. The calls can be made from UI, which is some front-end application, or it can be made from some backend. So it's not necessarily that, you know, you need to have calls coming from UI. You might have some other Python or Java service, okay? and that is doing some backend processing, that service can also call this HTTP server. Let's talk about deploy stage now. So we already covered part of it. Building APIs, building fast API server comes under develop and deploy stage both. Now, how do we exactly uh, build this server and deploy it to AWS, Azure, etc. framework? First thing you do is 
obviously you export your model in joblib or pickle file then you need to export other things if you remember in our uh, credit risk modeling project another project we were also exporting the scalar object some other metadata so there could be a bunch of files and we build a fast api server using all these artifacts that we have exported from our notebook or from our machine learning code then you also need python panda scikit-learn all these apis right these are called dependencies and you bundle all of these things together and create something called a container so container is an object where you have a server you have your metadata you have your python dependency panda scikit-learn anything that is needed in order to run this server container is this self-sustained object you can deploy it anywhere and it should be able to run your server with all its dependencies if you don't want to build a container you can take your fast api server and let's say you deploy it to some cloud machine let's say you have ec2 instance on aws which is just a cloud machine and you deploy this particular server right let's say this is my server as now this machine can have its own python version installed okay so this approach can also work but what if someone upgrades this python version or pandas version that may break this correct because your server has a dependency and let's say uh, they upgrade pandas version to some version where there is a breaking change then your server will get impacted therefore uh, in modern days what people do is build these kind of containers where you don't have a dependency on outside python pandas library etc you are still running on top of operating system so you still have some dependency but majority of the things that you need to run this server are all available in that box it's like you are getting some box at your home and you know it's let's say furniture so you have all the furniture all the toolkits the cloth everything you have in one box so it is this kind of box and we use something called docker to build these containers docker is a very popular framework uh, for building containers then you deploy this whole thing to either aws azure gcp there are so many other options as well and you will have probably uh, multiple instances of your server running so let's say you have a docker container now docker container can be deployed on multiple servers in aws okay because what may happen is there might be hundreds of people using your application let's say chat gpt is a machine learning application how many people use it so many right millions of people use it so then if they have only one container it's not going to work so they will have multiple containers they are running on multiple servers and aws azure etc manages your auto scaling so that if the uh, load increases it will automatically expand those servers okay uh, and this whole orchestration load balancing etc is done by something called kubernetes it is an orchestration framework which will make all these things easier for you now once again when you are using aws sagemaker or some ready-made azure cloud platforms all of these things are abstracted from you so that you just click some buttons and configure something and and these cloud providers aws azure etc will take care of it but internally they also use kubernetes so if you are deploying on your own cloud and if you uh, want to have full control on the orchestration etc then you will use kubernetes along with uh, docker now let's say we have a data scientist kathy who is building the code they will uh, check in the code to github or gitlab gitlab is another popular uh, solution for version control the underlying system is still same it is git now many companies set up something called jenkins pipeline or ci cd pipeline ci cd means continuous integration continuous development the way it works is once you push your code to github there will be a webhook so webhook is like a trigger so it detects that okay my main branch in my github repository got a code change whenever you get a code change it will trigger some job and what that job will do is it will build first of all a temporary docker image so it will take all your code changes it will build a docker image it will build fast api server and so on 
and then it will train and evaluate the model okay it might run some integrated test some unit test you might have all those tests so it will run those as well and then it will train and evaluate the model now let's say my model uh, recall is greater than 90 i can set anything i am just giving an example you can set up uh, this condition on accuracy precision uh, f1 score whatever parameter that doesn't matter so let's say for example you have this check on recall greater than 90 if my recall is dropping below 90 okay then the build will fail so jenkins pipeline will uh, trigger a failure an email will be sent to kathy saying that your change broke our criteria which is our recall went below 90 degree if you have unit test and integration test right unit test and integration test setup there could be another stage here which is running that and let's say if that breaks then also it will send an email to kathy and in your jenkins dashboard it will show that okay the build has failed so kathy will take an action and she will uh, fix those changes many times what happens is you are trying to fix something and that thing gets fixed but you will break something else so when you have this kind of pipeline setup you are running so many tests sometimes you might have thousands of tests that you can run automatically so that way your code is being tested on those thousands of uh, test cases and if something breaks you will get an email immediately now let's say your recall is greater than 90 in that case uh, it will say build is successful in many pipelines you have an automated step where you deploy from development to alpha environment automatically and then in alpha environment you can have another round of testing you might have some human testing there might be a testers qa team who will take your alpha build and start testing so this whole thing forms something called this pipeline and that pipeline can be set up using this tool called jenkins even in software development this tool is very very popular so if someone is talking about jenkins things like ci cd then what they're talking about is this kind of automated pipeline now let's talk about monitor when you have built machine learning application how do you monitor it well if you're using chat gpt you actually know it one way is the human feedback so when chat gpt generates any answer you can see this kind of icon thumbs up thumbs down so using that human feedback you you know if the answer that is generated is is good or not so let's say if i go to chat gpt and do thumbs down open ai team will get that notification they will have some kind of logging where they will be able to see that okay user is not happy with the response and they will do some uh, analysis on that there are other ways to monitor your machine learning application let's say in development environment you build this model using this particular data set and this is the distribution of that data set i have just shown uh, some kind of chart what i really mean is this is the distribution or the characteristics of a data set when you deploy that to production initially it may work okay but after some time there might be a change in the characteristics of the data that you are getting and when the distribution or the characteristics of your data set changes see look at the shape of this and this so my characteristics or the distribution of the data set change now when i try this type of data set on this model model is not going to perform well right if my recall is here less than more than 90 percent here it might drop to 65 percent because the nature of my data set has changed this may happen because of the temporal changes as well let's say when covid hit the world and if companies had all their machine learning models uh, those models would have been disturbed because they saw this kind of change in the distribution or the characteristics of a data set this is called data drift your data has drifted your nature of data has changed there are ways to detect data drift such as population stability index psi csi we'll talk more about this in this particular chapter the other uh, thing that you may notice is let's say in dev i build a model and i establish this kind of relationship between my independent variables and my target variable okay let's say this is a property price prediction problem where this is my price 
this is my area i train the model model looks pretty good and i deploy it to prod now in prod due to whatever reason the relationship between independent variables and my target variables might have changed initially it was just a linear equation now it is little complex it has become a polynomial equation of degree two so in this case also model will underperform so let's say here r square score value was let's say 0.92 in reality in the wild when i'm testing this model well initially this model may perform well but after some time nature of this relationship is changing due to whatever reason and let's say my uh, r square value drops to 0.7 and that is no longer acceptable this is called concept drift so in data drift nature of data or characteristic of data is changing in concept drift the relationship between independent variable and your target variable is changing you need a way to detect all of this and your data science team or machine learning team should get a feedback you know continuous feedback they might build some kind of power bi tableau dashboard they might have some kind of grafana logs where you know these numbers are recorded psi csi etc and if those numbers goes below a certain point you get a trigger you get an email okay and then you can take some necessary corrective actions as you can already see the ml ops life cycle requires use of variety of tools these are only few tools folks there are so many more tools as well i only talked about few tools so it's a vast field there is lot to learn here in summary setting up ml ops infrastructure is similar to setting up this car assembly plan where cars are moving from one stage to another these robots are fixing the doors similarly in our ml life cycle you know you are running unit test integration test then you are uh, evaluating a model you are doing bunch of checks then you are preparing a docker image then you are deploying it to alpha so all of these things are set up in a assembly pipeline and that is that jenkins pipeline that we talked about and this way the productivity of your team improves uh, you get enhanced quality and reliability and it promotes uh, collaboration there is better collaboration and governance so these are all the awesome benefits of mlops